I'll call this regular meeting of the Jacksonville City Council to order. I want to welcome everyone who's come out to the meeting this evening and also those who will be watching the uh, meeting on G10 television. We'll begin the meeting uh, by rising for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Council Member Logan Sosa, followed by the invocation of our City Attorney John Carter. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our Heavenly Father, we pause again to give you thanks. Thanks for your care and keeping of our city and of each of us individually. We pray for our nation, a nation that is divided on many issues. We pray that each of us will seek understanding forbearance, that we as a nation can come together for our common good. We pray tonight and give you thanks for the life and service of Councilwoman Alva Williams. We pray for her husband and her children as they mourn her loss. We pray and remember our service members who are serving here and around the world, and we pray for their anxious families. And as always, we pray for our mayor and for our council that your guidance and direction would be with them. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. This time, council, I would entertain a motion to adopt the agenda for tonight's meeting. Second. Second. Any discussion? Here, not all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. We have our first session of public comment for this evening, and I will call up in order that we're signed up on the sheet. Remember, it's a three-minute time limit uh, on public comment. So I will call Jesse Hansley. And if you would, when you come to the microphone here, uh, to give your name and address for the clerk, please. Jesse Hanley, 115 West Bayshore Boulevard. I'm the street captain for the Bayshore Stakes Neighborhood Organization. Thank you, Mayor, City Council, and City Manager. I would like to speak on behalf of Wilson Bay Park and the Bayshore Stakes Neighborhood. We have a lot of homeless people showing up, coming through our neighborhood on the way to Wilson Bay Park, where they stay for most of the day. We're working hand in hand with JPD after meeting with Chief Yanero, where he advised us to call, call, call. 
Here's a list of some of the incidents we've noticed in our park. People consuming alcohol in the gazebo on the water, drug deals in the parking lot, car to car handing products and money from windows, a subject with a gun inside the park and shelter, homeless people sleeping on picnic tables, the gazebo, and on playground equipment, swinging from the shelter rafters, sleeping in and around the bathrooms, two homeless individuals with mopeds parked at the shelter, female waiting in the bathroom for 20 minutes for a car to pull up and a male subject advised her as she exited the bathroom where his vehicle was located, individuals removing an alligator from the New River on Labor Day. They were confronted by the homeowner in the area and retrieved photos of the individuals holding the gator and license plate number of the vehicle, contacted JPD. Wildlife was contacted the next day and these suspects are under investigation. A vehicle parked outside of the park on the street in the no parking zone, one driver sober and two very intoxicated females at 4 a.m. I was personally threatened by a homeless individual sleeping in the gazebo after advising him the park closed at 9 p.m. These are just a few of the things we've noticed in the last 45 to 60 days. We've spoken with officers, Officer Fanny Miller in reference to our community watch program starting back up in our area. And we request new and more community watch signs being posted in our neighborhood. Our local citizens consist of a lot of elderly females who feel very uncomfortable from all the situations going on in our area. They even are afraid to go in their own yards because of so many vagrants in the area. We had a concerned citizen helping one of our elderly ladies in the neighborhood clean up behind her property and found the remnants of a homeless person residing in the bushes behind her house and removed it. We're asking City Council, Parks and Recreation, Susan Baptist and Mike LaCorey for cameras to be placed in the Wilson Bay Park area as they are in other parks in the city such as Jack Amiette and Northeast Creek. We feel it will help deter some of the illegal activities and provide a safer environment for our families and visitors who frequent our beautiful park. We would also like City Council, while making the new downtown improvements, if they could help with better street lighting in the Bayshore Estates neighborhood. We would also like to ask Jacksonville Police Department for more regular patrols, night and day, as the very presence of authority seems to deter some of the aforementioned illegal activities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Kirshner. Thank you for having me. Joe Kirshner, 101 Coon Circle. Um, should we talk about downtown revitalization efforts and downtown neighborhoods? And we're asking for your consideration of downtown neighborhoods, specifically Bayshore States, which Jesse just spoke to. Uh, these neighborhoods have you know, a ton of charm and character and location and the proximity to downtown. Uh, make them awesome, especially with the waterfront parks and the connections from downtown to these great parks, Wilson Bay, Sturgeon City. Um, Bayshore State's neighborhood organization got formed in 2016, and these folks have championed, particularly these three ladies back here for many, many years, uh, you, you know, working to get the city to take an active role in the downtown neighborhoods and commit resources to the betterment of all that is downtown. The um, transfer transformation and revitalization that's already happened and is happening now in downtown Jacksonville is, is awesome. I mean, I've seen so many projects come to fruition over the years. A lot of these initiatives were laid out and identified in the master plan evolutions of 1998 and 2007, and we're just now seeing, particularly the Newbridge Street project come to fruition. And I think that's incredibly exciting, and we don't want these neighborhoods to be left out of some of this redevelopment. Uh, and revitalization. And so in the 2007 master plan, they lay out five key points in the executive summary. It's all about the river, clear out the blight, focus on the neighborhoods. Specifically there, they mention older neighborhoods, and this is a quote, like Bayshore Estates, Cheney Heights, and the Mill Avenue Historic District must be protected and preserved. That should probably be expanded to conclude and include even broader downtown neighborhoods. But uh, Destination Sturgeon City, housing, tourism, and shopping. Um, all of those things, you know, are multifaceted projects and, and, and uh, efforts that, that would are probably already underway in many ways. But uh, we're looking to promote density in the downtown, capitalize on the proximity to the riverfront, and using our neighborhood as a gateway to some of these awesome waterfront assets. And, 
also in the 07 plan, one of the recommendations goes on page 33 to work with these neighborhoods to create identifiable features, including gateway landscape, logos, and signage, and that this participation creates community buy-in to revitalization initiatives, and it instills pride and ownership in the downtown. Uh, within our community, we specifically had, Jesse alluded to a lot of these, some specific uh, wants and requests and wish lists for, you know, some gateway signage and landscaping and decorative street signage and decorative street lighting and some of these things to extend the downtown revitalization efforts and pride to these downtown neighborhoods, not just Bayshore states. Um, with that said, it goes on into a few other issues about, uh, obviously a lot of issues, but it goes into code enforcement and I might visit you guys again and talk a bit about that, but I certainly second what Jesse had to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Jane Sutton. Jane Sutton, 115 West Bayshore, Mayor Phillips and City Council and City Manager. I am the Bayshore Estates Neighborhood Organization President. As not to repeat any aforementioned concerns, let me just take a brief moment to sum it all up. Bayshore Estates Neighborhood is a vintage neighborhood with a gem of a park sitting on beautiful Wilson Bay. However, to some of the neighbors, we are the forgotten neighborhood. Gone are the days where the lifetime residents can allow their children and grandchildren to play in the yard or ride their bikes to the park without fear. Or as seniors, ride their bike or walk around the block without fear of being approached or threatened. Gone are the days of well-kept yards and homes where all were proud of their home place and Jacksonville was proud to display one of the oldest neighborhoods as one of the best to live in in Jacksonville. We as a community are asking for your assistance with a stronger, more proactive code enforcement. Remove dilapidated, unlivable homes that have been left in this condition for way too many years. Also, we need more street lights. As we all know, crime doesn't like light. Our park desperately needs cameras and more patrols. Crime doesn't like uniform either. Our neighborhood watch is becoming stronger, but we need support for safety. The city is spending a lot of money to upgrade our downtown, and our neighborhood has been mentioned in past downtown master plan, all to be forgotten. We're asking you, please don't forget us now. With the new downtown area, our beautiful memorials and the museum coming soon, as well as Sturgeon City, we have more visitors coming each and every day. Please make changes for the Bayshore Estates neighborhood and Wilson Bay to be safe for all to enjoy. Please, together, let's be the beautiful vintage neighborhood and gem of a park we were always meant to be. Let Bayshore be a neighborhood the city of Jacksonville will and can be proud of. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you. Timothy Solemn. Good evening, uh, Timothy Solom, 100 Keller Court, uh, Jacksonville. Mayor and uh, Council, John Carter, City Manager. Uh, I'm here, I'm not here to bash Bayshore States or anything going on in Bayshore States. But one thing the Bible says is in the book of James 119, it says, be, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So I'm going to be slow to speak. I hope you'll be very quick to listen to what we, I have to say, and none of you get angry or take this personally. But uh, there is a situation, not just Bayshore States, but citywide. We have people who obviously don't understand the burning laws in Jacksonville. We are coming into fall now, leaves dropping, uh, and people decide to burn their yard waste. And it's a nasty thing because after my home is closed up all summer long, I would like to open my windows and air it out. But because you have these people who either they don't know or they don't care about the laws, if there are laws on the books, and there are, but they're very kind of vague, uh, they don't follow them. I've called the law many times on people burning in, in Bayshore states. It gets nasty. In fact, we've, the last few nights it's been going on. If I could find them, I would get the law in it. I would ask the council consider upping fines, making people pay fines for doing it, put signs in neighborhoods 
stating there be no burning and define what can be burned and how you burn it. The other day there was a yard I went by, they were burning. It was a 12 foot circle with bricks around it and they were filling it with yard waste. We can't have that in the city. We can't, it's just, it's, it's gotta stop. Fall and spring, it happens all the time. Uh, I'm also asking you all, we talked to Logan and Brian, to begin to have dialogue with the county, more dialogue. We have a homeless issue in Jacksonville and between the city council and the Onslow County commissioners and local churches, charities, something could happen. Something could be made to happen. We have many vacant buildings that can be used for facilitating other things besides one in the old Piggly Wiggly downtown. I, I, I hope you all can do that. County, city, get together and start working together instead of butting heads. And, oops, sorry, glasses. Uh, gosh. Oh, and one other thing. The park, Wilson Bay Park, at one time, it belonged to the homeowners. We owned that park. I worked for the city, and all of a sudden, the city obtained Wilson Bay, took it from us. I don't know how it happened. They said we signed it over. We didn't. I worked for the city. I was threatened my job if I didn't stop investigating that issue. So if the city has it, I hope the city would take care of that park now and do things, fix the boardwalks, patrol more often. But it was our park, but it still is our park as well, those who live there. And thank you very much. Y'all have a great evening. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Ray, uh, I know you've been made aware of some of the complaints that have generated out of the nation the state's area. What exactly are we doing to address them, if anything, at this time? Yeah, thanks, Mayor. We've had some really good discussion. We've actually talked with, with Ms. Sutton for almost the entire year in trying to look at some of the issues that are going on. Uh, as the homeowners group, we've had dialogue. I know Tracy's had dialogue with the group, uh, Michael LaCorey, Susan, uh, definitely Mr. Jackson and Mr. Sosa recently. Uh, we've changed patrol patterns. Uh, we have been monitoring the parks, but the park issue is a bigger issue that we're seeing in multiple parks throughout the city, as, as we've talked before, Mayor. That's going to be a challenge, but uh, Chief Yanero's trying to work through with their team in the community to make sure that we're getting that information back over to our police department, so they'll be the entity that helps us. Uh, some enforcement issues that Tracy's team's working on, uh, we're making some good headway. Those items are in the hopper, and they're a longer process. So I think a lot of these issues are things you see throughout the city, but we just have to have a dialogue. We have to continue being active to solve some of the problems. So I think we're moving in a good direction, Mayor, but we'll stay in contact uh, with Ms. Sutton. Mr. Solem's uh, concern there about the burning in the city, I thought we had, that was ordinance that we uh, enforced uh, and we stopped enforcing it. No, it is, Mayor. A lot of the times our concern is we have to get it reported. Uh, there's a lot of items that you can see in a city, but even on our code enforcement side, even with our police department, if we don't see it, you don't know. So we, we go back to the calls. We encourage people to call in to our non-emergency number whenever there's an issue, allow our community officers or our patrol officers to respond. Uh, that is something that that you see often, but a lot of people don't call it in. So we've had this conversation before. You've got to report it. Let us get over to it. And, and like you said, it's an issue. It's on the books, and, and we have to enforce with everybody. So, Can you put signs in a neighborhood? Signing. Mayor, we can, we can always put signs in the neighborhoods, but our challenge is what signs do you put up in the neighborhood? One of the things that we, that we do and that we're working on now is with our media team, pushing out more information. So this is a good example of, uh, of sharing the information through monthly newsletter, through social media, through our uh, neighborhood organizations to say, these are some issues we're seeing. Can you help us with this enforcement? A lot of times the enforcement's more effective if it's owned within the neighborhood, just like, like it's been mentioned by four individuals. So if we can get the neighborhood associations, whether formal or informal, to help us with the enforcement, that's going to be a lot more valuable than either patrol officers, parks, anybody else going out. So we can do the, the neighborhood watch are really good signs, Mayor, but the uh, temporary signs like we do with the speed trailer, you know, we've moved the speed trailer around in Bayshore. Those are valuable, but they're short term. I, I would I would be reserved to say let's put out permanent signs because 
sign clutter is also an issue, especially for, for some safety and put too many signs out. So when a police officer is on patrol and they observe someone burning yard waste in their yard, what, what action do they take or do they take any? Well, I, we had this discussion too, Mayor. I mean, we can go out and, and cite for those uh, for improper burning. So I mean, they can go out there and, and take an action then. I know sometimes a lot of these things are left to the code enforcement people to handle, but these are things that it's a city ordinance. Yeah, and the, the police officers, enforced. as you know, Mayor, the police officers work in tandem with code enforcement mm -hmm. because code enforcement typically happens 7 o'clock in the morning till 5, 5.30 in the afternoon. Right. Then they hand that off effectively to our police officers. So the men and women of our police force, they handle a lot of our code enforcement issues throughout the evening, through the wee hours of the night, and in circles back around. Um, Tracy's team stays in communication with Chief, and so they, they work hand in hand. I, I would never say that things only happen between 8 and 5, so that's where those officers play a vital role in making sure that we're sharing that. We see this right now with... Uh, Trailers parked on the side of the road, boats parked on the side of the road. These are issues that typically happen in the evening hours, and, and it's against city ordinance, so our police have to come through and help out. So is there an area officer assigned to that particular area? To Bayshore? Yes, sir. Okay. I think the, the changeover recently, but uh, I believe, um, I think Phantom Miller is actually the, the Bayshore, right? I think that's what Jesse had said. But that's that's changed over recently, too, Mayor. Council, you. Well, I, burning is an issue in a lot of neighborhoods because I called the police as a result of the burning. And and like was said, we just got to be more diligent as as people from a community, and that's that's every community to be able to speak on behalf of themselves and make it sure that the community remains to be safe. You know. Um, I don't know, like you say, you could put it out through social media, maybe through the water, a bill, kind of reemphasize that. But we have a lot of issues that, you know, and our burning policy is you don't burn. <laughs> you know, that's, you know, it's could not we, limited burning. So. Could we put those up like, you know, those road signs, the, the digital ones that are d during, like, say, seasonal periods of times where you could put that just as a reminder? I mean, I know we don't want permanent signs maybe all the time, right? So, like you said, but on those, like the ones you drive around, you know, in different locations, is just to kind of remind people about that. I don't know if that would be an option. Yeah, we use those often. Sounds if good. if we Absolutely. move the ones we have now, then the geese are probably in danger. But uh, <laughs> we could relocate those for a temporary time. And uh, we like to use the utility bill. Yeah. You know, we actually go through a, a strategy for getting the information out in the utility that bill. And that strategy follows our social media posts and it follows the information that we're pushing out. So between, uh, between Lisa and Mr. Massey and, and Tracy, we have those dialogues that try and get the information together. But just like Mr. Jackson said, uh, burning something that typically the neighbor is going to see it, and hopefully we can encourage our citizens that just because a neighbor reports a violation doesn't mean your neighbor doesn't like you it means you're doing something you shouldn't be doing and it impacts my house it impacts my ability to live on my property and it would be nice if you could just say hey mr carter please stop doing this but we also don't want to create that type of, of dialogue so well i mean if it's a self-initiated uh call by the police if they see something like that it takes the neighbor out of the equation that's right it, it kind of reduces the uh, possibility of conflict between neighbors at that point Another thing, you know, it's not just the smoke that he's talking about, but I, my concern would be fires getting out of control in the city, and that's that's a big concern I would have. So, and it's not hard to do with, you know, we still are tree city, and trees like to burn if they catch on fire. So, I had a question, yes. Mr. Ray. Since I'm um, the liaison to the environmental appearance for our October meeting, maybe this is something that Mr. Corey can put on the agenda so that our council chairperson, um, the chairman, can bring this forward and um, the committee can do something else in terms of what other resources that we can help give to not only to this community but the community overall in terms about the burning ban ordinance that we currently have and possibly list what the current fines are and the fact that we're going to go back and look at these fines to determine whether or not um, subsequent changes needs to be made at this point in time. 
and that's that's a great ad. All of our committee meetings are televised and recorded, so they run on G10 or they may run online. So to be able to have a meeting where we bring this up, like environmental uh, appearance, that'll give us an extra outreach opportunity so people could go back, watch part of that meeting, see the information, maybe share it with a friend or a neighbor and say, hey, have you seen this? And if we put that policy out there, we just need to highlight that more often. But, uh, you know, that's a bigger concern, Mayor, especially as we go from, from a dry season. It's always a concern everywhere in the United States. If, uh, if we're not handling uh, fire appropriately, then it may be a bigger issue that, that Chief Tomlin's definitely going to have an issue with. So. And the other thing that I'm thinking about, um, piggybacking off of the gentleman here, we're getting ready to get into the fall season. So one of the discretionary things, um, how do you distinguish between personal um, products that are being burnt in the yard versus individuals who are living in the older neighborhoods that have fireplaces? So you're smelling the burnt of the wood, but are you able to distinguish that between an appropriate fireplace burn, wood burning, and someone burning something out in the yard, and how do we resolve that issue? Yeah, I think the best thing is we start this communication now. It may, it may require additional visits from our team. I think in the forefront, we just need to figure it out. I'd love to say that we're an old school community where we're communicating with our neighbors effectively off the front porch, but I, I think that would be, uh, I think that'd be silly on my part. So there may be some times where we send somebody out to communicate with a citizen and it turns out to be, it's just, I'm doing this or I'm off the back porch and I'm doing a burn in a, in a controlled burn area that I can do that's just wood and a, and a good common fireplace. We're just going to have to go through those uh, labor pains to make it happen. Well, I think what we've got to do is we've got to continue to look for a uh, solution to respond to the, the concerns that they have over there. Yeah, yeah, Mayor, you mentioned today in another meeting we were in about the, the homeless population, and I can tell you nationwide we know this is a concern. The council is actually looking at multiple things that will address some of our homeless issues in the community. One of the <laughs> items is on the agenda tonight, and uh, for people to think, that issue's in a vacuum. It's definitely not. Homelessness ties into to workforce. It ties into mental health. It ties into housing availability. It ties into just your overall health and your ability to respond. And so I, I like the comment that we need to continue working with our county. And I think we're doing a really good job of, of working with our county. Uh, but we just don't have a solution. So we just have to keep working big picture topics to try and figure out how it's going to happen. Uh, the homeless population can utilize our city parks, right? Just like the rest of us. We can all utilize city parks. Uh, we should not uh, allow uh, open container alcohol. We should not allow prostitution. We should not allow drugs, either use or sale in our public parks. So those are things that we can enforce, but hanging out in the park is not illegal. And it's actually something we encourage. So well, yeah, and, and the problem, it probably is not isolated just to, to the Wilson Bay area. It's, it's all over, I mean... There's not very many neighborhoods in town, in town or in the county that's not experiencing some degree uh, of, of homeless, uh, uh, homeless populations. So there's a, there's a lot more to it. There's a lot of moving parts there. So and we'll keep we work yeah. on that every day, yeah. Mayor. So just mm -hmm. just so you know, it's an active issue for us to try and figure out not only how do we protect parks, protect citizens, but how do we protect all of our citizens? And, and I think it, whether our, our homeless population is from here or they're from somewhere else, in my eyes, Mayor, they're our population. And we've got to figure out how we can help people get services that may uh, help them um, live better. So yeah. whatever we've got to do, we'll figure it out. Like somebody was speaking today, the mental health uh, crisis is a contributing factor. Uh, to this and uh, until somebody gets a hold on that, you know, it doesn't seem like anybody uh, wants to rise to the occasion to, to try to address that. I think you were telling me the other day about a meeting that y'all had where it's, it was almost like the wheels spinning in the mud and, and nothing coming out of it. So, you know, at some point in the time, somebody uh, in a position to be able to do something about it is going to need to act mostly our state legislature and anyway. 
can we look into the possibility of the cameras? I mean, I think it's a good point, and not just, you know, that park, but in all parks, really. I mean, I don't know what the feasibility and, you know, making that happen, but I think it would be a good, because that would a, cut down a little bit of personnel, you know, especially the police. They can't always be there and always patrol. But I think if someone does know there's a sign or there's, you know, an eye, and, you know, the big brother's kind of watching, that might help keep some of that stuff away. It probably won't solve all the problems, but I think it would help, you know, at least, dial down a little bit so I'd like to at least look into it to see if that's possible and feasible to do and I know I know Senator Lazaro has tried to work really hard to get something you know in the works you know to have some type of aid you know uh, as far as you know facilities that can accommodate people that are mentally distressed and, and get some type of help for them okay, and, I see the thing here. also can we make sure we could get information out to the base? Because what I'm seeing is with some of the folks that's doing certain things in communities, there's a lot of young people that don't understand that there are rules, especially in the city. I'm not saying send the ordinance, but at least deal with certain main issues from the ordinances that may affect them uh, in terms of rules. And then maybe even concerning what's happening, you know, in the fall, the change over the seasons, more burning, we might want to do some kind of campaign or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. so. Oh, and also, Mr. Ray, speaking about the surveillance of the cameras, if possible, um, since there has been quite numerous activities over by the bypass with homelessness campers, um, if we can possibly look in at surveillance cameras in that area as well. I can tell you, if we, do a, if we do an advertising policy that uh, Mr. Jackson and Ms. Edwards do fantastic voiceovers, so we could utilize them for the voiceover. So if, we can, if you can just get them to commit, we'll work on that. I'm sure they'll be glad to. We'll work on that there. <laughs> could be negotiated. <laughs> All right, so uh, we'll go ahead and go to the minutes of the September 5th, 2023 workshop meeting. Uh, we need a motion to adopt those minutes. Motion to approve. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Brings us to number eight. It's a public hearing on a, uh, am I right? Did we do the consent items? And the consent items, I'm sorry. Okay. Motion to approve the minutes from September 5th and the consent items as listed on the agenda. Brian? Second. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed. Okay. Thank you, Angela. Mm -hmm. Next, we got a public hearing uh, on a voluntary annexation. This is on behalf of uh, Jacksonville WW LLC Kimley, this uh, Kimley Horn Associates, and uh, this is Richlands Highway and Yacht Road. And Ron Massey is going to present this item. Mr. Massey. Mayor and Council, uh, on behalf of Jacksonville WW LLC, Kimley Horn Associates has submitted a petition for a voluntary annexation of two lots totaling 4.32 acres on Richlands Highway that is contiguous to the current city limit boundaries. The property is located at uh, Highway 258 and Yop Road. The developer proposes to build a Wawa gas station and convenience store. Uh, <clears throat> the financial analysis shows a positive cash flow over a five-year period of approximately $293,000. The uh, staff recommends that council adopt the annexation ordinance as, as presented. Uh, here's, here's the property you can see. Uh, on the right-hand side, Yop Road on the bottom, uh, just opposite Yop Road, there happens to be an old gas station building, convenience store building on one of those lots right now. Is it better? What you see is this is, eventually there's gonna be an access road and then a, a parallel access road to 258 in that area. That this is all part of the plan when the inter, when the interchange is is uh, constructed. You see, there's the map that shows the interchange. Off to the right, you see Yop Road, 
And then across from Yap Road, you see uh, <clears throat> a road going towards the north, and then that parallel access, that access road that's parallel to 258. And that's at the intersection of, of 53 and 258 and 24. Any questions, Mr. Messer? Is that part going to be done by developers or is that by DOT? That, that, that well, the, the driveway in to start with is, is basically the developer will, will put that part of that road in to start with. You won't see the access road until the actual project goes. But DOT already has, has the acquired all this property or there well not necessarily in that area but the the developer you know the property owner knows that that it's going to be right away so it's it's land that's being protected so that the interchange project can in fact go forward usually There's, the rules as far as this protected uh, well on, on this particular the, property so there's no restriction on on the other ones, not right now, not unless there's some properties and we don't know exactly which properties that DOT has acquired, you know, because of the property owners have requested DOT to advance purchase, you know, the, the land. Uh, but the, the right of way acquisition for this particular uh, interchange project is not until I think 2028. That one. But the corridor has been established, correct? The, the corridor cor pr protection? No. Okay. No. No, DOT's not doing that anymore. Oh, uh, they kind of got there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay. Good deal. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Massey? Thank you, Ron. So this is a public hearing uh, on this matter, and I will reset the regular council meeting and open up the public hearing. Is there anyone present that wishes to speak to this matter? If so, please come to the podium. I don't see anyone stirring, so I'm going to close the public hearing and we're going to reconvene the council regular meeting. And you're being asked to uh, consider the annexation ordinance. Anybody? Mr. Mayor, make a motion that we approve the ordinance as presented. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. That brings us to old business here. This is uh, item number nine. This is a public hearing uh, that we is still open. And uh, Jeremy, you're going to give us a little... Yes, sir. This is the uh, tabled or recessed public hearing for the proposed annexation, or I'm sorry, rezoning of the Tallman property along uh, Jacksonville Parkway. Um, since that time, we have received a request to withdraw this rezoning request at this time, and so the, there would be no further action necessary from City Council. And if y'all remember, this is the one where the sound barrier uh, was an issue. So... All right, thank you very much. So with that, I will recess the public hearing and uh, we'll move on to uh, number 10. And this is the water shortage response plan. And I'm assuming Wally Hansen is going to be the presenter on this matter. If you'll give me just a second, Mayor, I'll take get your time. to those slides. Here we go. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. If you recall, at our last meeting, we had a discussion topic on uh, the city's water shortage response plan. At that meeting, we talked about the requirements of the law and that the city had um, prepared our draft water shortage response plan amendment, submitted it to the state for review, and we had done a public hearing on that. In the discussion, uh, with you, you requested additional information primarily related to the enforcement action portion of our plan. And you ask us to go out and compare other plans 
Uh, we as a staff have done that. And what we did is we, we kind of concentrated our comparison to those around us, uh, primarily because they face many of the same challenges we would because they use the same source water that we would. Um, that said, I did look at a few other plans from the center part of the state, and I'll just give you a very brief overview of what I found in those. But the ones that we compared were Craven County, the city of New Bern, Pender County, Cape Fear, which serves Wilmington, and then Onwasa, uh, which is Onzo Water and Sewer Authority. So they would have, they would be the closest, they would provide every uh, water service in the county that the city does not provide unless there's somebody on a private well. So this was the um, enforcement action slide from our plan. As you can see, um, we have five stages um, that range from voluntary to basically water rationing uh, because water supply is so short or demand is so high. And you can see that our enforcement extends from a warning to $500 to discontinuation of service. And then as a note, you'll notice that for um, levels three, four, and five, there is a volumetric charge. What I'll say is Craven and County, Craven County Water and New Bern look almost identical to ours, almost down to the same table. Um, so those two are using this exact same enforcement action that we are. Pender is similar um, but they only have three levels. So their levels are really, one is voluntary, and then their level two looks very similar to our level four, and their level three looks very similar to our level five. But otherwise, they're very similar. Onwasa and Cape Fear differ slightly, and they differ enough that I couldn't figure out how to put them in a table to compare them, so I figured I'd just discuss it with you. Um, Onwasa has five water um, levels also, shortage levels also. Um, for their first offense, they have a warning. And uh, same with the city, stage one is basically voluntary. So stage two would be where this starts. Uh, for their second offense, for stage two and later, they have double the rate. Uh, and then for their third offense, stage two or later, they have double the rate plus discontinuation of service. Um, so depending on your rate compared to the cities, their fine could actually be lower because, you know, double my water bill would probably be less than $250. So their, their enforcement is slightly lower than ours. Um, looking at Cape Fear, again, they have five water shortage stages. Um, they have a warning for stage one, and they are more aggressive than we are. Stage, their, their, sec, their stage two first offense is $500, and then they discontinue for everything after that. So your third offense of stage two would be a discontinuation of service, and any offense for three, four, or five, they would discontinue service. Um, I did also look in um, how you know, most of those would, um, there, there was nothing in the plans of how those would allow people to reconnect. Basically, what I found talking with others is you have to let people have water so you would reconnect them, but you would be much harder on them and disconnect them quicker if you found them doing stuff that was contrary to the plan. Primarily, the, the fences that um, others have seen is primarily, not surprising, watering lawns. So, um, matter of fact, when I was talking to uh, one of my counterparts, he actually mentioned that people would try watering lawns at like 3 a.m. to get away with it. So that was, you know, that was the biggest. But then you have to pay the reconnection fee, and sometimes they're not in as big of a hurry to go back and turn them on. So. Um, I can't say that's exactly the method that we would, if, if we discontinued service, um, we would look to resolve that issue before we got to discontinuation of service. Uh, but that's what I found because you did ask that question. Um, with that, I also mentioned that I looked at a few others. Uh, the two others that I specifically looked at were Fayetteville Public Water and then um, 
Orange Water and Sewer Authority, which would be OWASA. Um, and those are two of the bigger water providers in the center of the state. Um, of course, Raleigh is also in there. Um, but for those two, it, they differ so much in the fact that those two have differing rate structures as soon as you start going to different levels of the plan. So while they do have enforcement action, they also have a varying rate structure that takes over from their normal rate structure. Uh, so I really didn't build slides off of that because their plans were much more detailed with um, those tables and rate structures included. So with that, I will be happy to answer any questions. Um, I will be happy to look up for any additional information if you need that. Um, but the, the staff and the Water and Sewer Advisory Committee would recommend um, approval of the plan as presented. All right. Council, any questions of Wally on the... Uh, When's the last time that we ever had to get to stage four or five? I mean, it's... Never. Yeah, okay. I no, so. and, and I'm not even sure... It, the, you know, this all came from the seven to the 2007 to 2009 time frame. And the center part of the state was literally counting days of water. And we withdraw our water from deep water or deep aquifer uh, water wells. So, you know, our shallowest well is probably 210 feet or so. And our deepest well is in the 780 foot range or something. So we aren't as impacted as those that draw from a surficial like Jordan Lake. I mean, you know, if you, if you think about Durham, who takes out of um, that same body of water, it literally goes Durham, Raleigh, Goldsboro, Kinston, New Bern, and then part of Craven County and uh, actually Marine Corps Cherry Point because they're all withdrawing from the Noose River Basin. Yeah. And a lot of those are surficial. So they face a very different challenge than we do. We've, I'm not even sure that we've hit stage two. So, and we haven't in the eight years that I've been public services director. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions or comments? All right. I'll just say thank you, Wally, for digging yeah, up the information and doing the research. Yes, thank you. Thank you. It's fair. I mean, I think it's a fair plan. So, Councilor, you've been asked to consider the uh, plan as presented. Move for adoption. Second. Any further discussion? Sure none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed. Okay. That brings us to item number 11. And this is a housing development policy. And Tracy Jackson, our Director of Neighborhood Improvement Services, will be uh, providing us information on this item. writing with some red ink on there's been modifications that uh, Tracy and Mr. Massey and others have uh, asked that you consider uh, this amended resolution in front of you as you can hear from Tracy this evening. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Thank you for having me today. Wonderful for your consideration. The housing development policy, the reason that we need this policy is so that we can access resources from federal, state, and local funds. In other words, the partnerships that we would form would need this to have these resources in order to build affordable housing here in the city of Jacksonville. The policy will also include a holistic approach to address all of the housing needs here in the city of Jacksonville. As a recap, wanted to bring forth some information that we shared at the recent retreat that we had with council, the budget retreat that we had with council. So housing affordability versus affordable housing. As a rule of thumb, all households should pay no more than 30% of their monthly income. Affordable housing includes affordable housing for low income households to include safe and decent and sanitary housing. 
What that means is households who earn a little bit less than $15,000 should not have more than $370 in a monthly rental cost. On the other hand, households who, owns, who earns $40,000 in an annual income should not be paying more than $1,000 in monthly rental expenses, housing expenses. What that means here in the city of Jacksonville, based on the Census Bureau, we have a little bit over 11,000 people who make less than $22,000 a year. The Jacksonville area medium income is a little bit over $47,000. Average household income is less than $25,000 annually. So for people who earn minimum wage, they should not be paying more than $377 in rent. For the average renter who received this decent pay, they shouldn't be paying more than $1,100 in a monthly rent. Pay attention to the 50% annual area medium income. This could be a single parent with two children, a boy and a girl, who should not be paying no more than $900 a month in rent. But the housing market here in Jacksonville dictates that a three bedroom that that single person, that single family, single parent family, she's going to need a three bedroom apartment. And that three bedroom currently is $1,300. And her income was $35,000, but the income to sustain the $1,300 rent is $54,000. So she's going to pay an extra $450 to have housing for her family. Currently, we have in our annual action plans allocated for affordable housing infrastructure, we have allocated for years 22 and 23 $120,000 to help developers come in and pull forth any resources that they have from federal and state. Local match right now is $120,000 from our CDBG funds. That's what we currently have. What we also can have in the future is access some general funds, access resources such as city-owned land, CDBG funds through, throughout the city, Grant funds through partnerships and developers who've already secured funding through the federal and state level. And we can also offer exceptions to local ordinances. This policy is a sister to the recent economic development policy that you adopted. Economic development and housing go hand in hand. One cannot be without the other. So I, if you have any questions, I'll Entertain any questions? And I want to look back at the slides. Which one? The one thing you said, Jacksonville AMI, was it 47000 Yes. And that, that includes the base, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Just want to make that clear. In our new 2020 census. Ms. Jackson, do we have data on approximately how, um, what the percentage of our residents living within the city of Jacksonville are homeowners versus renters? There is some data that I could get for you, um, how uh, homeownership versus renting, um, and I can get that from the American Community Survey, and I can bring that back to you. Okay, because the reason I asked, um, this past Saturday, I had an opportunity to per actually attend a function where the Deputy Secretary of HUD was in Wilmington, North Carolina, um, Michelle Perez, and she gave out some very interesting statistics, um, considering when you're looking at women. But before I get to those statistics, one of the things that she talked about was when the federal government established the FHA from 1934 up until 1965. 
92% of FHA loans went to white families, which basically meant that people of color was only able to garner 8% of those loans for that period of time. The other thing that she spoke passionately about was that the majority of the renters in the United States are African American women who basically are living be below the poverty line and they are spending well over 53, actually 53% of their annual household yes, towards rent. So if we're looking at women, we're looking at poverty. Now one of the issues that we are also starting to see with women is childcare. So you're looking at paying rent, you're also looking at child care, and both of these two entities are now, are basically beginning to stretch beyond what a woman's paycheck can grant her. It was interesting enough with that when she talked about redlining, one of the things that I didn't realize was that was also something called pink lining. And pink lining was up until 19... 74, a married woman could not get a loan for a mortgage, nor could she get a credit card in her name. It had to go into her husband's name. So I'm wondering with pass redlining, pass pink lining, pass regentrification, how are our communities of color being significantly impact that when you're talking about affordable housing, what does that affordable actually mean when you're talking about hard earned dollars and being able to have a salary that if you don't have a college education, if you don't have the wherewithal to make an annual salary of $47,000 a year, then how is providing housing going to be obtainable as opposed to something that's in a stratosphere for these women and their families? I'm glad you asked that question. One of the things that we, that I am most proud of is having programs that those women and anyone can have access to housing. So what that means is our home buyer education course, our money management course, those are the ground, as far as those are the ground rules that they have to come in and get that education. Once they get that education and learn where they are in the home buying process, then we work with them and we make sure that they can obtain resources through North Carolina Housing Finance Agency, through our own CDBG programs, and just knowing what they have to do. That piece of education, that is key. Some of our people, some of our households, um, and I want to say most of our households who have taken advantage of our down payment assistance program here at the city of Jacksonville, they're single women and they are single moms and they would not been able to obtain housing had not been for our programs. Um, these are women that probably would have fallen through the cracks. We've also had single men take advantage of our program as well. So it, our program, we look at people who can qualify <clears throat> and also people who can, you know, want to go through the, the extra, that mile, that last little bit of um, even getting another or second job to be able to qualify. Because it's some hard you know, choices that they have to make. Do I want to work two jobs? Well, in this economy right now, you're going to have to work two jobs. And once we give them the roadmap, most of them, they finish strong. So we are now tracking all of the people that we have coming through our classes, even though they um, take advantage of USDA and other resources, whether they buy in the city or outside in the county. They're taking advantage of our classes and they're doing what they need to do um, to make sure that they can attain home ownership. 
So as far as redlining and, and all of those illegal practices now, um, we work with our lenders. We make sure that terms and um, all of the requirements are met. So we educate our lenders as well um, about programs. But the federal government, they do a great job when it comes to making sure that all of the terms and disclosures and all of those items that's going to be needed to close on a home that they address. And people can come. We're a certified housing counselor agency. People can come in off the street and let us look at their loan documents. And we'll let them know whether or not these loan documents um, have the correct amount of disclosure, have the, the correct amount of information so that they can uh, make a decent loan, a safe loan, to where they won't fall victim of predatory lending. Mayor, if I can add one more comment. Uh, Tracy pointed out that the housing policy is a sister policy to economic development. And the reason there and the strategy behind it is, just like Dr. Washington is talking about, part of our goal is to recruit new industry into the community that's going to pay more for those jobs. So then our challenge is making sure that we have the workforce available here that can obtain those jobs. So you talk about the strategy that, that the team's looking at for home ownership. Well, first we have to have housing opportunities available. Then we have to work with our education system to make sure that those people have that education needed to do those jobs. And then we have to bring in the new industry. All of these things, kind of like we mentioned earlier, are tied in together for how we're gonna raise as many people up as possible so that we're obtaining this level. Whatever that level is for a person, we want to help people get to that point. Our home buyer's education program, uh, it's phenomenal, but we have to have the inventory. We have to have the opportunity to have jobs that help make those numbers. Because like Tracy said, we don't want our people having to work two and three jobs for home ownership or for home rentership. We want to try and figure out these numbers and, and help our people rise up in the process and it's it's not easy it's not going to be easy but uh, we're very confident that this is another this is another step in the right direction for for the community for the council and and even the neighbors you know our neighboring communities uh, that's part of the thing that that we put into the policy is we're going to have to start targeting outside of our municipal limits that maybe we're going to ask the council to purchase some property that may be good residential housing land and when we target that, we're going to bring it back to council. If we do that and city buys something, then we annex it. Then we do the work like we do at uh, Project Frontier. And then maybe we're able to sell that to a quality developer. And then when we, do, when we get to that point, then we talk to that developer about how we can partner with them so that they hit the spectrum of multiple la layers within one housing development so that we're hitting 30%. 40%, 50%, 80, 100, whatever that spectrum is, that's our vision. That's our goal is how we're going to pull it all together piecewise. But it is a bigger picture, but it's a huge step to get us to that point. It's a big struggle because even, you know, you look at the, the salaries. We have teachers that can't afford to live, you know, rent or own a home. You know, if, it, if today they had to go out and buy it. You know, I have to applaud what your department does because... And I've seen um, and met with people that have gotten, uh, you know, achieved home ownership, changed lives. Well, with our the HUD economic mobility concept, um, just because you start with a salary, once we have them in front of us, we tell them that you can do more. You don't have to have the poverty mentality. You can raise yourself up. You can go and get an education, earn more money, there's a way to do this. So if they stick with plans, they will get mm -hmm. housing. They will be able mm -hmm. to afford a house. And very, very pleased with the um, infield construction that we have done in the past throughout the city. And we still have more to come. Mr. Ray, I want to piggyback off of something you said, and I want to ask you a question, sir. Um, recently at the, um, the North Carolina Military Affairs Commission meeting, um, there were the discussion about the military bar, the basic housing allowance, and the fact that 
the government needs to put in more monies in the coffers to give extra money to military personnel and able to afford housing. So my question, what I really want to ask you is that pretty much probably the rent in, that is set in Onslow County in Jacksonville is probably taken into consideration the military bar, which most civilian families don't have that opportunity. But as a council, do we have the opportunity to work with Ms. Jackson and her staff looking at the latest data as it relates to what the current salaries are? and looking at what individuals should be paying versus what they are paying. And based upon that data, do we have the ability or would we have to go through the General Assembly to put a cap or freeze that the rent cannot be raised, that it would stay at a start? I see you, Mr. Carter. I, I see you. <laughs> However, uh, one thing that I've learned from you, Mr. Carter, we don't break the law, but boy, we can... <clears throat> flex it without breaking. So I'm just saying is part of addressing this issue, the possibility of a moratorium, a possibility of a freeze, of a capping, because what I honestly see is that if more money is put into those military um, active duty individuals, they're going to outpace and sow that gap of home equity is going to continue to widen. And, and Mayor, we've seen this with some of our housing discussions recently, is that let's just imagine if someone was paying $500 a month for a rent, and then we're looking at a basis from a military personnel allocation of $900, $1,000, $1,100 a month, you're gonna see typically what we're seeing is raising that rent to that market, whatever that market is, and I think that's an issue. I do believe that we're very limited in creating a cap. I think that's a challenge that even the state legislature would have a struggle with, with putting a cap on uh, rents in our community. I think this is a national dialogue. I, I think there's a lot of value to the concept. What I do believe, though, is one area where our team can potentially have some impact is continuing that dialogue and bringing more of these people to the table. Think about this strategy. If we're able as, as a city to tell a developer, we can assist you with $200,000, random example. We can give you $200,000 if you give us 10 units. And this is Tracy's strategy. So if, if, we give you, if you can give us 10 units at 30% for X number of dollars, will you do it? That's one way that we can end around to make a direct impact on a development. It doesn't matter if townhouses are being built at $250,000, they still may take that same $250,000 townhouse and charge a rent on it at our 30% number, the number that was just shown. I believe, based on any of my knowledge, that that's the only way we can be successful in obtaining the goal that you're saying. It's gonna have to be through partnerships um, Tracy, Mr. Carter may know something a lot smarter than I know, but I think that's our best bet in terms of creating those relationships with the partners that we have now to develop a better plan. I, I, you don't see a lot of this happening throughout the country. You see a lot of, of bad plans. You see a lot of poor execution. I, I think we have a format in front of us with the concept that you just said that we can be successful at least on a small scale and then try and replicate it once we figure it out. So that's our vision for how we can make an impact on the, uh, the differences in monthly rents and then what that monthly mortgage is gonna be. Because like Tracy said, the only way that a lot of people are gonna be able to purchase a home at this point in history in this, in this elevated home ownership is, is stacking investors, right? And we would be an investor. If, if someone's gonna buy a house and we're investing in them, and we have the ability to forgive something after 30 years, and, and HUD has the ability to forgive something after 20 years, that's how we're gonna make it a positive impact. And it's not gonna be a simple solution. Uh, it's, gonna be a, uh, it's gonna be an effort. So I, I love the strategy. We just gotta figure out how to end around to be successful. And that mixed use concept is, I mean, it's the only way to go, because you, I've heard of families, you know, what would be considered kind of medium income for the area, they're being put out of houses because the homeowner can sell the house for a lot more now. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, we, we had a difficult time. 
That's what it is. Yeah. Mayor, we've, we, part of the, the changes that you see in the printed version in front of you, we edited. Uh, Mr. Jackson has, has questioned the concept of affordable housing, and we've debated that as a yeah. team, and that's a good thing. So we're not defining affordable housing in this policy. Now, when we work through procedures, we're going to have certain things that we present to council that just strategies moving forward. We're going to define it just like Tracy's defined on this schedule here. And we're going to use a lot of the, the HUD standards because that allows us to flex as they flex. But we, we've taken back a little bit of the concept of affordable without trying to define it in a policy. But we still want our community to understand it's about non-market price housing and that's where the big picture's at so that it's not just workforce it's not a transitional it's not this this and this it's a it's it's a different type of housing that we have a huge need for in the community mm -hmm. Ms. Edwards. Okay. Um, we're not real estate developers we're not building contractors nor are we landlords. There's a good reason that mixed use development is the standard and government housing is not. Government doesn't do anything in free enterprise very well, so it's best that we don't go there and meddle too much. Um, saying that, you know, that said, you know, this is not an effort for us to take over a real estate market. This is an effort to incentivize builders and developers already working in the area or who are interested in working in the area. Um, to add low income and moderate income options and units to their development so that we can facilitate that truly mixed use development. We don't need projects that the government controls. We need, you know, families in homes throughout our community together in mixed communities. Um, but we need to make help incentivize these folks to take advantage of grants and the things that Tracy knows are available so that folks who need access you know, if you're living on SSI, you, you just, there's just no way you can pay rent anywhere by yourself, much, and many times not even with a roommate. So if they're, they're just people who really need an option. They're not looking necessarily for someone to carry them down the road, but they just have no option. So they end up in cars and they end up in parks. And, you know, we just want to make sure that we give every chance we can as a local government for developers and builders in the real estate market to help include some of these folks in their plans. And I think what the manager was saying about us getting involved in, you know, procuring property or even finding land for the developers to use would be uh, very progressive, in my opinion. Yeah, Mayor, we're confident that, that this is a good strategy from, from our side of the team. One of the things that we updated on page two was uh, section 2.4. Uh, we said activate diverse nonprofit, and that goes back to what Ms. Edwards is saying. We're not going to be the leader in building and developing. We're going to be a partner that pulls multiple in. As it was mentioned earlier, we want to partner with other people to make sure that we're at the table, we know there's an issue, we're trying to, to figure it out. So I, I think that's spot on, Mayors. Um, we wanna try this and we're excited from the staff side because we know it's new, we know it's, it's innovative. Uh, we just gotta get that support and, and bring some really good projects back to council so that you see the confidence. So hopefully by the time we roll around to FY25 here in a few months planning, you say, hey, let's do a little more here. So we're... I think over time we'll see i mean we already have begun but uh gonna have to go private public partnerships with a lot of our projects going forward you know? i just want to thank council for at least considering it has been a long time coming and we i'm just very proud to to know that council is considering um, housing as part of the initiative because it is needed it is needed and we do need resources. I can't do it all with my CDBG money. Uh, we need other resources and I'm just so proud to know that this, to, to me, this is historic. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Trace. Anybody else have any questions, comments? No. Thank you, Trace. Okay. Uh, Council, you've been asked to uh, adopt the uh, housing development resolution. I get a motion. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing that, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And I'll be signing, I'll sign off on that whenever it's prepared. Okay. All right, Council, this time I'd ask uh, a motion. 
Uh, you you want to go through the reports, man? Oh, yeah, let's do that up. first. So, uh, in that'd one be, city moment. Be a good idea. That. So, reports, Mr. <clears throat> Jackson. Yes, I would uh, first like to mention uh, on September 2nd, it actually marked the third anniversary of my mother passing. But we, what we had planned prior to that, prior to COVID, was the 60th anniversary of Bell Fork Homes. So instead of that, we had on that day, we had uh, that, the 63rd anniversary. And I'm um, so proud of that community, so proud of the relationships that were created out there. Many month appointment ringings actually established housing out there before they went forth in the community. Um, we were family, so it was, uh, it was actually, a, I call it more of a family reunion than just a neighborhood reunion. So that was the high point, you know. And, um, you know, uh, it was mentioned earlier, be quick to listen and slow to anger. Um, sometimes we, we run into tense moments up here. You know, a lot of us are passionate about things. I, I was affected, um, I felt personally, when the, we lost so many folks lost their housing over at uh, formerly New River, um, currently Town Center. So, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna have those times where we're gonna raise up and I, I turn burgundy, people turn red, you know. Um, but at the end of the day, we're trying to figure out how to make sure the city moves forward. And I hope that more of our community can work towards that with us. That's all, Mayor. That's it. Mr. Sosa. No report. Happy to be here. No report. No report. Dr. Washington. Uh, yes, I have a report. Um, this past Saturday, I had the opportunity to be a presenter for the North Carolina Project Lead um, White Lotus Award to constituents throughout the Wilmington, New Hanover, Brunswick, Onslow County, and um, we had five recipients from North Carolina. One is Dr. Connie Bruce Gilliam, who is out in the audience. We also had um, Pastor Barbara Hubbard, who is a pastor at St. Julia Amy Zion Church, my hometown, my home church of birth. Also, we had Mrs. Mary Louise Pearson Moore. In addition, we also had Captain uh, Melvin Uring, um, United States Marine Corps retired, and Chief Warrant Officer Tamisha Smiley, United States Marine Corps retired. On this past Friday, I had the opportunity to attend Rolling Thunder, POW MIA, at the Lejeune Gardens the, um, to honor our um, from the state of North Carolina, actually, we still have 38 missing in action that each of their names was called and we stood in reverence and solidarity, hoping that one day that they will be returned back home to us. So that's my report. Thank you. Ms. Edwards. Thank you, sir. Um, I'll just add um, on Sunday at 1 p.m. at the um, Montfort Point Marine Association building on Bryn Mawr, uh, there is a suicide prevention run and a kickoff event happening that day at 1 o'clock. I'll be there, um, and I'd like to let the public know that that's available and open if you'd like to come and uh, be part of the celebration and also part of the remembrance and part of the effort to make sure that we do everything we can to curb veteran suicide. Um, and in relation to the discussion we had during the public comment and thereafter, um, I'm sure Chief T knows and is probably grinning, October is Fire Prevention Month. So part of what will be happening in the month of October specifically is information related to fire safety, um, you know, smoke detectors and other kinds of things, but also we can address is in, in tandem with that burning in the city and, and base, you know, best practices, what you can do, can't do. So it's a great opportunity for us to kind of close the loop on that conversation. And it's a little far out yet, but if you are like me and you like to mark your calendars in advance, October 23rd, we will have, as we do every year, the Beirut Memorial Observation at the Memorial in Lejeune North Memorial Gardens at 10 a.m. on the 23rd. No report, sir. Um, just want to let everybody know this is Constitution Week. Uh, we actually had a uh, co commemorative uh, service on this past Sunday at the Freedom Fountain. Uh, mm -hmm. Had uh, one one young fellow, older gentleman, who came uh, dressed in actually dressed in a, a Revolutionary uh, War uniform. Uh, 
glad it was a cool day because that thing was made out of wool. I mean, he would have probably incinerated if we would have had that heat. Uh, have Mr. Ray. As uh, multiple members of council have pointed out, we have had a, a very active time in a very active community. It's incredible to continue to see things going on in and around Jacksonville that give you pride day after day after day. Uh, Patriot Day observance, this was um, I, I, a moving experience. I, this is my first Patriot Day observance here in Jacksonville. Last year this occurred right before I made it into town. Uh, you will see multiple members of our Public Safety Honor Guard, our Youth Council members, uh, city staff, and Onslow Civic Affairs Committee, uh, all active. As I said earlier, uh, Mr. Jackson and Ms. Edwards uh, were, they, they did some of the voiceovers for the uh, victims, and uh, that's, it was, it was incredible. For, for those of you that participated there, thank you so much, because um, it was something to witness, and I, I encourage you, good Lord willing, to, to be there next year for this time. You will see members of Camp Lejeune's 2D Marine uh, Division Band and the local high schools. If I go back to here, you're going to see uh, Pam Trafton's son. Oh, she was here earlier, but, uh, but her, her son's right there as well. He participated in the Youth Council, um, and you'll see Jacksonville High School Cardinal uh, Chamber Streams were part of the program. Multiple members of our team there throughout the day. I'll just say our ability to remember our people and the things that impact us as a community is impressive. Uh, and it's, it's nice to have multiple members of the team to be present for the day and, and, to, uh, and to be active. As uh, Dr. Washington pointed out, we had the uh, Prisoner of War Missing in Action local uh, Rolling Thunder North Carolina 5 chapter that observed this day, and this was on Friday at the uh, Memorial Gardens. Dr. Washington was present for this event. It's another one of those opportunities to allow us not to forget those in our community that have not returned home. And as a community, our ability to have a Memorial Gardens that gives us a place where the presence is real and it allows us to congregate together and to uh, appreciate uh, those that have served and those that have not returned home. So I, I think this is something, if you're, if you're able to participate, I encourage you to, to be there. Thank you, Dr. Washington, for matching with the name tag. Mr. Jackson never matches me. That's our gold star mom. Incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, the Marine Corps Half Marathon, very exciting to see people that actually want to get out and run and have some exercise. It's great to have the Half Marathon because those of you that want to try and run a full marathon, God bless you. These people are in a lot better shape than I ever imagined myself, even in my best dream. Uh, well, they're in the front, too, so they're, they're leading uh, by example. Uh, very exciting, though, because... To have our media team, to have our city tourism yeah. team there, uh, we featured 175 Leader plus names and faces of uh, those Marines that have been killed in action. And that's our way of remembering multiple people and to gather for an event that raises awareness for the community and for those that, uh, that have served and paid that ultimate sacrifice. And that part right there has to be something amazing if you're running anything to see the words finished to tell you you can now stop running. Uh, what, a, what a great way to, uh, to finish up and to see multiple members of the community being active and still standing. Here's a, here's a really uh, exciting thing. This has been working for a while now. Um, Pat Donovan Brandenburg received the Governor's Conservation Achievement Award Water Conservation of the Year and was given that award not by the guy in the picture, but by <laughs> Governor Roy Cooper. Um, how great is that for, for Pat? Uh, we've known that for quite some time, that she is uh, extremely knowledgeable. She's a strong member of the team. Uh, her efforts in, um, in the conservation of our waterway, it's, it's a leader, not only in the industry, but in the country. And as we talk often, uh, our story is beautiful and a lot of that goes back to the work of, of Pat and her team and multiple members. Um, anybody can get in the picture these days. So uh, I tell you, 
if Mr. Hargett's here somewhere right now behind me. I mean, but, but this is great because if you talk about people that, that deserve some of this recognition, Pat is a fantastic member of our team, and it's an honor for us to have it. And in case you couldn't see the awards he was given, there you go. I encourage you to, check, to, to go talk to Pat because she's going to tell you the story, and that's a big part of our history. And we need to be able to share the story of not only of the reclamation, but of what Sturgeon City does now moving forward. I've said it before, I'll say it again. This is something unique to us. No one else can claim this, and, uh, and Pat will gladly share this with you. We gave it a little extra zoom in too, so you can see uh, how proud we are. Um, and this was, the, she recently had the event where she was given the award, and it's very exciting to have our members of the team present. Uh, also completed 20 years with the city. 20 years, you know, and that's it's also part of our history. That's our team. That's our people doing doing great things. So we're very excited there. We did have a hometown heroes event uh, on uh, August 10th, and so it was in uh, Swansboro. I think the mayor was present. Uh, Chief Unero was present. Uh, you're going to see multiple winners here from. Uh, Mike Caps was the Law Enforcement Achievement Award. Uh, it would be Cat and Caps, but he retired, so now we're just going to refer to him as that guy. But he was recognized. <laughs> uh, next to him is Alyssa Bernard. She's a telecommunicator, and she received the CARE Program Leader Award. Very exciting. Standing in the center is Officer XY. Uh, he received the Longest Serving Law Enforcement Award. Uh, very exciting to see there. Uh, next to XY is uh, telecommunicator uh, Nunishka Mayorano. She received the Telecommunications Leadership Award. And then um, next to her, you're going to see Emily White. She received Telecommunicator Care Program Award uh, winner. And, and this other guy. I don't think he was part of the program, but it's good to have him. If he was still here, we'd recognize him. This is awesome for us because it is appreciating our team, and this is showing you performance. You remember the last meeting, we were able to talk about our people receiving awards in the community, and this is the greater region. And so our people are being recognized over and over again for their efforts, for their activity, and, and they just make us better. They give us the ability to serve our citizens each and every day, and what a great team uh, that, that Chief Yanero can be very proud of. Um, right here, you see also with Chief Yanero, uh, Sergeant Jason Lagana and Corporal uh, Daniel Karate. They're seen here. Both received the award for leadership in charity-based law enforcement events. That's also a huge part of what we do in our community, and it's a big focal point for Chief Yanero and his team. Uh, it's great to see the activity as, as we come around with our officers. Our officers are all community engagement officers. They're not just patrol officers. They're not just police officers or investigators. They're all 100% community engagement. Uh, we had a couple Boy Scouts of America projects that we just wanted to let you know. Right here, you're going to see, um, see Scott Rixman uh, gave a tour, uh, but... The, uh, this of the filtration. So Eagle Scout William Lynn was presented, he presented an award to Scott uh, just to show thanks for his, his understanding of the process and, um, and to share with our scouts how we do things. If you think about a water treatment process and a wastewater treatment process, this is an excellent opportunity to educate. That's not me. I was not going to dance either. But this is an excellent <laughs> opportunity for us with our scout program to share some of that knowledge. What a great team at the water plant. I encourage people, if you've not been able to, to get over there, then uh, to check it out one at a time because it's not that big of a place. But um, we're very proud of our Boy Scouts. We encourage scouts to come through, especially the Eagle Scouts. If they've got a project, you come contact us and we'll hook you up and we'll put you to work. So as I said, Mayor, a lot going on because our team in this community and in this region is incredible, and we're very proud of them, and thanks for giving us the opportunity to, to share some kudos to them. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. At this time, I would entertain a motion to go into closed session. So moved. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay.